It's not easy to get real-world bioinformatics experience outside of a job. There are lots of great tutorials out there, but projects are often the best way to apply what you've learned. So here are 15 bioinformatics project ideas. Let me know what are your favorites, and I might make videos that show how to implement some of these projects. Let's start simple and reproduce a figure from a paper starting from the supplementary materials and not the raw data. So you can go to a journal like Nature Communications and find an interesting paper that has a source data section, find a CSV file that corresponds to one of the figures, and try to plot it yourself. The nice thing about this approach is that it's easier than starting from raw data, but you're still learning how to make plots with R or Python, and you will practice wrangling data to get it in the right format before you can even plot it. You can look at other journals, of course, uh, but I like Nature Communications because their articles usually have a source data file that has well-labeled Excel sheets for every figure or even subfigure. The next project takes it a step further and reproduces a figure starting from raw data. So Ming Tang has a blog post and video about reproducing figures from this paper, where he goes step by step on how to go from raw data to aligning reads to calling chip seek peaks and using R to plot the figures. Another example of this is from the Alexander Lab at Woods Hole Institute, where they show how to reproduce this paper that ran various RNA-seq experiments to measure differences in gene expression when zebrafish live in different water temperatures. Next, let's talk about benchmarking projects. This is where you run tools under different conditions to understand how they behave in terms of speed and accuracy. So project number four is a benchmark that compares the speed of BET tools and MOSTEF. These are two tools that you can use to calculate the coverage from a BAM file. Coverage is basically, at every position in the genome, how many reads intersect that position. For this project, you basically run both tools on the same data set and measure how long it takes. You can then compare your results to the most depth paper and see how it compares. If you want to extend the project, try using different data sets. Does it make a difference if you use Illumina data versus PacBio data versus Nanopore? And if you're not into measuring coverage, you can always benchmark tools that are more relevant to your own research interests. Project number five is asking how deeply do I need to sequence my sample before I can detect what I'm looking for? So if you run a metagenomics analysis, what happens if you run it with only half the sequencing reads or a third of the sequencing reads? At what point can you no longer detect a certain bacteria? And how fast does that curve drop off? If you want to take it further, you can learn how to use a workflow manager like SnakeMake or Nextflow to scale this up to many data sets. So you can imagine that for every data set, you subsample at many different levels, and for each level, you might run the same subsampling a few times to get some error bars on your analysis. So there's a lot of automation here that could be interesting for a workflow, but maybe it's good to start simple with Bash, using one sample and a few levels. Number six, you could do the same thing for variant calling. You start with a FASTQ, you subsample, align the reads, run a variant caller, now you have a VCF. Maybe you can use VCF disk to compare the subsample VCF to the original VCF. Then you need to look at the metrics like precision, recall, F1. And through the process of this, you'll really get comfortable with variant calling, with accuracy metrics, and generally speaking with VCF files, which are not always easy to understand. Project number seven. When you do a sequencing run and get a FASTQ file, does the order of the reads matter to downstream analysis? So if I do some sequence alignment, does the order of the input change the output BAM file? And are those meaningful differences? You can go further and test whether the order impacts variant calling, like this paper suggests, or if I reorder reads in a FASTQ, how does that impact gzip compression? Does that change how well the file can be compressed if I change the order? These papers suggest that might be the case. 
The next project is to investigate the effect of parallelization. So take one tool of interest, like most depth, and vary the number of threads for the same data set. How much faster does it get? And what's the shape of that curve? You'll probably find that parallelizing with n threads is almost never n times faster. Then you can run a second experiment where you split the input data so that you get one file per chromosome, so 23 files for the human genome. And then what if you ran 23 instances of most depth in parallel, each of them using one thread versus running one instance of most depth that uses 23 threads on the entire data set all at once. Both approaches use 23 threads, but which one is faster and is more efficiently using the resources on the computer? Now, if you don't have 23 threads on your computer, you can use a handful of chromosomes to test this on. Speaking of parallelization, if you've been thinking about doing a master's or PhD in parallel with your job, our sponsor has the program for you. The University of Florida's Department of Microbiology and Cell Science offers master's and PhD programs that let you pursue a graduate degree remotely, and it can even be part-time. Their online master's program is made for working professionals and can be customized with over 40 graduate level courses to choose from. And their distance PhD program is as rigorous as a traditional PhD program with some tweaks to let you do your research and coursework remotely. As a student in this PhD program, you'll join a lab at the University of Florida and conduct original research using biological data. To learn more about these programs, check out the link in the description below. So back to our projects. If you're more interested in the software side of bioinformatics, here are a few more projects. Number nine, build a web app that runs bioinformatics analysis. Now this can be as simple as counting how many G's and C's are in a DNA sequence with some basic HTML and JavaScript. Or if you're adventurous, you can use my Bioasm library to run command line tools in the browser. For example, you can ask the user to give you two short DNA sequences, and then you can run K-Align on them to do multiple sequence alignment and visualize the results. Number 10, this is a visualization project where you ask the user to give you, let's say, a FASTQ file from their computer and you show them the first 50 reads and let them hover over the quality scores to see what they represent in terms of probability of base calling error and FRED score. Number 11 is a debugging tool. This can be something like fastq.bio or bedqc where you can check the validity of files. Another example is to take a BAM file from the user and run some basic sanity checks. Use SAMTOOL commands to check whether the file is truncated, or you can use SAMTOOLs to get some statistics about the BAI index file. Number 12, contribute to an existing bioinformatics tool. Now this one's not easy, but if there's a bioinformatics tools that you're really interested in, and you can see a lot of low hanging fruits for you to pick, that could be a good way to start a collaboration. The next set of projects are about teaching what you've learned by writing about it. So it's one thing to read about a topic, but to create an educational resource, you need to dive much deeper and make sure you understand the fundamentals, otherwise you can't teach it. So one thing you could do is write an article about statistical concepts like p-values or statistical tests you often see in papers. If you wanna go further, you can make interactive widgets that let users give you some data and you can run the tests on that for them. Number 14, article about bloom filters. This is a really interesting data structure. You could talk about how it works, how it can be useful in genomics. And again, if you're adventurous, you can make your article interactive using this JavaScript library that lets you create bloom filters in the browser, and you can let the user search for a DNA sequence that uses the bloom filter. Number 15, an article about KMERS. This is yet another important data structure that's used in a lot of tools in genomics, and you could talk about the more complex concept of minimizers, which are used by tools like Kraken and Minimap. 
You can also make this an interactive article where users can enter a DNA string and a value of K and you generate all its k-mers. You can also do some basic k-mer counting, maybe plot some histograms, maybe even show stats like what's the probability that a k-mer is unique in the human genome for different values of k. For more project ideas, you can check out our previous project ideas video. And we also have videos that implement projects like the genes and geography tutorial and our intro to RNA-seq. Now, Mike Schatz, a professor at Johns Hopkins, has even more bioinformatics project ideas from his applied genomics class. All the links in the description. Again, please let me know in the comments which projects seem interesting because I want to make follow-up videos that show you how to implement some of them. Thank you.